Hi all, welcome to the session on constitutional law. What is seen in this picture? Yes, it's the constitution of India. Today we will be discussing about the salient features of the Indian constitution. What do you mean by a salient feature? Salient means the most important or the most noticeable features. Now let's see what are the most important features of our constitution. Firstly, it is the lengthiest written constitution in the world. What are the different types of constitutions that you have heard of? The first and the foremost classification can be written and unwritten constitution. Our constitution is a written constitution whereas in UK there is an unwritten constitution. Our constitution initially when it was enacted had 395 articles, 22 parts and 8 schedules whereas now we have 448 articles, 25 parts and 12 schedules. We have borrowed the ideas of from various world constitutions, fundamental right from America, direct principles of state policy from the Irish constitution, emergency provisions from Germany, parliamentary form of governance from the British system, concurrent list from the Australian constitution. Why the constituent assembly members did that was because they wanted to ensure that India being an infant democracy it is better to add the best practices followed across the world to the constitution itself and it shall not be left to the whims and fancies of the ordinary lawmaking process. The second feature is the establishment of a sovereign social secular democratic republic. What is seen in this picture? Yes, it's the preamble of the Indian constitution and it establishes India into a sovereign social secular democratic republic where all these terms are they there in the constitution when our constitution was enacted? No. The term socialist and secular were added through the 42nd Amendment Act in the year 1946. The term sovereign means India is a free country. It is both internally and externally free. It signifies India's departure from the status of dominion in the British Commonwealth as set up by the Indian Independence Act 1947 to a free nation when the constitution of India came into effect on Jan 26, 1950. The term socialism is not defined in the constitution. However, the directive principles of state policy contained in part 4 have a socialist character embodying the philosophy that the welfare of the larger society shall precede the interest of the individual. In India, we follow mixed economy and socialism aims at equality. The term secular implies that India is not a theocratic state and thus does not have an official religion. It also implies that religious activities or beliefs should not interfere with the civic or state affairs. The state is concerned only about the relationship between man and man and not man and God. As we all know, India is the largest democratic country in the world. What do you mean by democracy? The term democratic means that the government is of the people, by the people and for the people. A democratic form of government will be responsible and representative under which those who would administer the affairs of the state would be chosen by the electorate and will be accountable to them. The term republic signifies that the state shall be headed by an elected official and not by a hereditary ruler, like the British monarch. The next salient feature is the parliamentary form of governance. India chose parliamentary form of governance from the British system. The main reason for the same was that India was more acquainted with this parliamentary system than the presidential system. The parliamentary system is based on the principle of cooperation and coordination between the legislative and executive organs while the presidential system is based on the doctrine of separation of powers between the two organs. In India, at the centre, the Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers are responsible to the Lok Sabha and whereas at the state level, the Chief Minister and the Council of Ministers are responsible to the State Legislative Assembly. The moment a government loses confidence, a no-confidence motion shall be passed and the government will be thrown out of power. In a parliamentary system, the President is the nominal head of the state whereas the real powers lies with Prime Minister and his Council of Ministers. Now we have fundamental rights. What do you mean by fundamental rights? Fundamental rights are covered under part 3 of the constitution of India. These are basic rights that are meant for promoting the ideal or political democracy and 
overall development of an individual. This includes the right to equality, freedom of speech and expression, freedom to move around, right to life and liberty, etc. However, fundamental rights are not absolute in nature. Certain restrictions can be imposed on the same based on factors like public order, health, morality, etc. This is to strike a balance between individual interest and social interest. These rights are justiciable in nature. That is, a person can approach court if these rights are violated. The next salient feature is the directive principles of state policy. What are directive principles of state policy? These are given under part 4 of the constitution of India. Directive principles of state policy are not justiciable in nature, which means one cannot approach court contenting that directive principles of state policies are violated. Directive principles are directions to the government to incorporate these principles while making laws and it is necessary to attain the concept of a welfare state. The aim of DPSPs is to provide social and economic justice to people. In the case of Minerva Mills vs. Union of India in 1980, the Supreme Court held that the Indian constitution is founded on the bedrock of the balance between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. Now, we have fundamental duties as an exalient feature. The fundamental duties are given under Part 4A or Article 51A of the Constitution of India. Whether these fundamental duties were there in our constitution when our constitution was enacted? No. It was added through the 42nd Amendment Act in the year 1976. There are 11 fundamental duties and the last one was added through the 86th Constitutional Amendment Act in the year 2002. While the rights are given as a guarantee to the people, the duties are obligations that every citizen is expected to perform. However, like the directive principles of state policy, the duties are also not justiciable in nature. The next salient feature is the unique blend of rigidity and flexibility. Can you imagine what would have happened to our society if our constitution is still the same as it was created in 1950? Yes. There would have been revolutions and chaos in the society. Thus, law should be dynamic in nature and should change according to the changing needs of the society. So, we have amending provisions to the constitution. It is covered under Article 368 of the Constitution of India. If the amending procedure is very rigid, it can create chaos in the society and if it is very flexible, it can undermine the basic features of the constitution. Thus, we have adopted a mechanism which is neither too rigid nor too flexible. That is, amendment through simple majority, amendment through special majority and amendment through special majority plus ratification by more than half of the states. This type is usually used in amending features that are related to federalism. We will continue with rest of the salient features in the next session. Thank you.